Coming up, marking 20 years of casino gambling in Missouri, but is it now an industry in decline? Why the mayor is adamant the city honor Kay Barnes with something substantial, but what does he have in mind? Kansas City police are doubling traffic enforcement tickets, but has it got anything to do with the court shutting down red light cameras? Also this week, rekindling the border showdown and determining the fate of Kemper once and for all. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. Those stories and more coming up on the program that goes behind the headlines, making news in Kansas City, dissecting the week's stories, KCTV5 sports guru Neil Jones, from the Pitch newspaper reporter Steve Vokrot, from the Kansas City Star development reporter Kevin Collison, and star political reporter, columnist and blogger Dave Helling. She left office exactly seven years ago this month. Now, Kansas City Mayor Sly James says it's time the city did something substantial to recognize the contribution Kay Barnes made to the city we call home. It's time for the former mayor to receive the recognition she deserves for pushing downtown Kansas City into the 21st century and restoring its relevance. That's what Mayor Sly James believes. Currently, the plaza in front of Sprint Center is named after Kay Barnes. Is that not considered sufficient? Kevin Collison? Well, essentially, we're talking about a big sidewalk uh, honoring a woman who I think many people, including her critics, would have to recognize did an incredible job of reversing years of blight downtown, pulling together a lot of cats and herding them in one direction, which, again, Mayor James told me after having been in office for a couple of years, he even respects more what Kay Barnes did, knowing how difficult it is to get things organized and accomplished in this city. But you think about how many thousands and thousands of people go by the Sprint Center uh, every day, every every year. There needs Jones. to be a statue. I interviewed her uh, two years ago, immediately prior to the NCAA tournament being here outside the Sprint Center, and I said there should be a statue here because without her, there is no Big 12 tournament. There are no more NCAA tournament games in Kansas City. They would all be in Tulsa and in Wichita. Those are the markets that have stepped up and built beautiful new facilities, who don't have professional sports, who want to go after it. She saved our bacon because without her, it doesn't get done. But some people would argue, Dave Helling, that there have also been a lot of debts relating to what has happened downtown, including in the Power and Light they, District that the city is still paying right, for today. They wouldn't argue that. That's a fact, actually. And, and one other legacy of all the development downtown is less city money available for other city services. Uh, we're going through a discussion now in Kansas City about cutting fire stations. One of the reasons you have to reduce the number of firefighters is because you're paying money for what's going on downtown. That doesn't negate the importance and significance of some sort of honorific for Kay Barnes. And I think my colleagues are right, the mayor is right. They'll find something that makes her name a little bit more prominent. But we should not use that as an excuse to end the debate over whether this was the wisest way to spend money in Kansas City. What about renaming the new streetcar line after the former mayor? Call it the K. By the way, <laughs> the city unveiled the new color scheme for its new streetcar fleet this week, white, black, and silver. They described it as classic and classy. Others claimed it was dull and boring. But any chance that could be named after Barnes? I'm sure if there's some political will to do it, uh, you know, perhaps. But it would seem a little odd given that she uh, she wasn't really around for that whole process. Uh, you know, maybe maybe naming a stretch of a different boulevard after her would be more logical. I, I think one of the, you know, to me, a, a logical thing would be 14th Street between the Sprint Center and Broadway because it, pen, it cuts right through the heart of all the things that she helped put together. Yeah, the streetcar really had nothing to do with her legacy, but the redevelopment of the South Loop area of downtown, which was a disaster, there's no other way to put it, 12, 15 years ago, definitely was under her watch and something of that nature. And I think there are actually some people who pitched the idea of renaming the Broadway Bridge after her. Now, I don't really see the connection. It's certainly high profile, but something needs to be, and the mayor believes, connected to her legacy of what she did in helping rebuild downtown. Just quickly, I think the the Broadway Bridge is brought up because she was the first mayor from the Northland, and, and that is the connecting edifice, if you will, between the North and the South. 
I know we're going to talk about replacing Kemper later, but maybe if they build the American Royal exhibit hall down there, we could call it the Barnes, <laughs> and it would be named after <laughs> Kay Barnes, but also would be a barn. Maybe that would work. How long are the mayors on it, though, and how long does it take? It took a long time for Charlie Wheeler to have the downtown airport named after him. In fact, that didn't occur until 23 years after he left office. 21 years after Mayor Harold Rowe Bartle left office, before Bartle Hall came into being. It was seven years after Dick Berkeley left the mayor's office, before the Berkeley Riverfront Park was dis dedicated. Emmanuel Cleaver Boulevard came into being a year after Emmanuel Cleaver left the mayor's office. And what about Mark Funkhauser? Is there anything named for him? <laughs> I don't hear a great hue and cry to uh, remember the legacy of Mark Funkhauser other than a giant sigh of relief. It could be, the, well, what about the streetcar named after him, the Funk? And we're going to have these streetcars. Come on, Neil. Don't, don't, but he was still the mayor. We've had all of these mayors. They've had something named after them. Doesn't he deserve that, too? Not necessarily. You don't think so? Okay. No, I would disagree with that. I think that, uh, you know, you want to commemorate your mayors in some ways. I don't think you need a statue to Mark Funkhauser, but you might name something after him. And I think eventually they will, actually, Steve. in Kansas City. I agree. I think, you know, some of the, you know, three years on, there's still a lot of uh, uh, funk bashing after all this time. But, you know, even if it's something small, I think it's appropriate given that he did serve for four years. Well, Dave already mentioned it, so let's get to it now. What would you like to see happen to Kemper Arena? After years of debate, the facility's fate is about to be settled. The Kansas City Council Committee says it's ready to make a final recommendation on whether to demolish or revamp the 40-year-old arena in the next 90 days. The American Royal, which has veto power over the arena until 2045 because of its lease with the city, wants Kemper demolished and replaced with a smaller agricultural show facility. The cost of the plan, $60 million. Private donors have already pledged $10 million to the project, but the rest would have to come from the city and other public sources. A rival idea uh, pushed rather by Kansas City development company Fouch Brothers would save the arena and convert it into an amateur sports complex. Their plans include building a second floor inside Kemper, turning the arena into a massive youth sports and training facility. But does that plan come with the cost of public money as well, though, Kevin? Well, the Fouch brothers say they can do their project for $21 million using private financing. They're also seeking historic designation for the Kemper Arena so they could get some historic tax credits to help with the deal. Uh, in my mind, you know, I, uh, A, I don't think the council's going to resolve this so easily. I think we may have a committee, we may have a report, but we've got some pretty ti titanic forces bumping up against each other. we got an American Royal that in my mind needs to prove their worth to the community before the city even com considers providing that kind of financing for a, you know it's up to it, the ball is in their court to me to show that the royal is an economically important institution in this town and it's not just some relic of an era gone by whose relevancy is not really all that important anymore to the community especially to the tune of 50 million dollars in public funding and getting rid of the kemper which we may disagree about this but i think the kemper wrong place to build the thing, which again was at the request of the American Royal 40 years ago, has some architectural relevance, has some cultural relevance, and has some real potential for reuse because, one last thing, then I'll shut up. When they did the Sprint Center, there were some smart people who took a look at Kemper and looked at how it could be retrofitted to accommodate the needs of the American Royal. I thought they came up with some very good ideas that have not gotten much attention, and hopefully the council is going to revisit some of these things that were talked about. I think the Kemper has got some legs. I think it certainly has a place in the future of the West Bottoms, and it should have a place for the American Royal. What about the idea, though, of making this an indoor sports facility, though, that could be used by youth leagues as a training facility? I mean, would there be a need for that, well, Neil? When they have built those facilities in Kansas City, they largely have succeeded. There have been a, a few notable exceptions. But uh, just anecdotally, I have spent many hours over the last two winters with my son's soccer team indoor soccer matches at midnight on a Saturday night or 9 p.m. or 9.30 p.m. Uh, at an indoor facility on a school night for games, for matches, because there's a lack of space in the Kansas City area. Soccer has exploded. It is big in the winter. It is big in the summer. Would it be big at Kemper? I think that's a very interesting possibility. So even though they built all these spot, uh, soccer fields, it seems, all the time in all of these cities, they've all 
have been outdoor fields. So this would be something different because this is going to be indoors. There have been indoor facilities. There are indoor facilities tucked away all over the Kansas City area in any direction you go. And what you find is they are all there's not enough turf, indoor astroturf, to go around. Does one of these ideas have the inside track though, Steve? I mean, is it the American Royal plan to have a smaller arena or keeping a Kemper Arena alive and doing something like we've just proposed here, which is this indoor sports facility? My impression is there is some division among policymakers at City Hall about what to do relative to these two proposals. I don't know that there's consensus, and if there was, I don't know that they would be having this committee to, uh, or this, uh, uh, this council committee to look at it. One thing that'll be interesting is they're also going to look at the West Bottoms more broadly, and this is one of the most studied places in town. The Urban Land Institute did a study on this a couple years ago, and you know, one of the things that's interesting is there's a lot of division in the West Bottoms among property owners and business owners about what the future of the West Bottoms should be. As we're, by the way, building a statue for Kay Barnes, we should remember that when she proposed the Sprint Center, she promised it would bring a professional sports franchise, which is a, it has not, to Sprint Center, either NHL or NBA. And she also promised a reuse for Kemper, which it has not developed either. We've never really answered the question of what to do with Kemper, and it's complicated, Nick, because the American Royal does have an interest in that facility. It has a lease that the city has to honor for many, many years, and their argument has been it will be cheaper for you, city, to help us build these uh, you know, agricultural facilities than it will be to continue to pay for the upkeep of an arena that gets no use other than a couple of weeks out of the year. So, so when, when you ask if one idea has a, a leg up on the other, we have to keep in mind this is a very complicated thing. It's not a question of whether we just tear down Kemper Arena and build something in its place. There are a lot of different stakeholders and a lot of moving parts. Talking about forward. having a sports franchise at uh, Sprint Center, you know, I saw in the letter section of the Kansas City Star this week that a lot of Letters to the editor saying, and now is the time for an NBA team, especially with what's been happening with Donald Sterling in with the Los Angeles Clippers. The NHL has been looking at expanding its league. Can we just revisit this very briefly here, Neil? Is there any possibility of a team coming to Sprint Center? Uh, in the in the short term, no. Uh, the Clippers are going nowhere. I don't care who ends up buying that franchise if Sterling is forced to sell. It, it, it has a great niche in that market. They're in a wonderful building at the Staple, Staples Center. They have a great brand. Suddenly, after 30 or 40 years of bad basketball, they're playing good basketball. They have, they're a brand name. They're selling a lot of merchandise. They're going nowhere. What happened in Oklahoma City was they had a gentleman who had a billion dollars or hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars who was from Oklahoma City and he determined to buy a team and move it there. We don't have anybody like that. We never have had anybody like that. It's very, very simple. If you have the money, that you can buy a team and you can move it wherever you want. Next up on Week in Review, frequent viewers to this program know that the business border war seems to show no signs of dying down, but a fierce border battle of a different kind has been surprisingly dormant now for more than two years. It's the clash between Tigers and Jayhawks, and just recently, KU and MU rekindled their 100-year-old rivalry on the softball field during a regional women's championship game. It marked the first time the teams from Missouri and Kansas have met in any sport since MU left the Big 12 for the Southeastern Conference back in 2012. Need Jones, this is the story you hear more about than any other, but does it really matter? And is there an opportunity for this to rekindle itself and they're going to be playing again? I spoke with someone who was involved in the negotiations when Missouri left the Big 12, and he told me, in my opinion, this is an opinion, in his opinion, these teams will not play in any game that they schedule until Mike Alden, the athletics director at Missouri, and Gary Pinkle, the head football coach at Missouri, are gone. There is a tremendous amount of bitterness toward those two gentlemen, and in his man, this man's opinion, he said, I don't see Kansas ever agreeing to play them as long as those guys are there. Now, shouldn't that be fair enough, though, given that, really, this has been a situation where MU basically filed for divorce from a, a league that had KU in it? Kansas told them in no uncertain terms, and we're very clear with them, that, look, if you make this decision, this, this rivalry's gone. 
Now, it might benefit Kansas in women's basketball, in football, in baseball, and some of these other sports to play Missouri because it would be their biggest ticket probably. But the fact is they don't need them in basketball, and ba basketball pulls the ship over there, and Bill Self has no reason to play Missouri. So Kansas, their attitude is, you know, we told you that these were the ramifications, and you walked away. You chose to go that direction. So Missouri finds themselves with a bigger football stadium, with a bigger television deal. They're in a bigger conference, and they have no arch rival. So what difference does it make to Kansas City? I mean, did we really benefit from this rivalry? Or is this a good thing? Because really, do we need to be dredging up this sort of negativity, really? Because at this point in time, from well, an economic I, development point of view, I, well, Kevin Collison, don't we want to be having harmony between both states? Uh, you know, I, it's a great marquee battle. It, you know, it's, it's, it's popular. I guarantee you, if people could figure out a way to lure those two teams to either play in the Sprint Center or play at Arrowhead. It would pack the stands. It would make a lot of money for both schools. And if there's any common theme in sports these days, money talks. And I have a hunch, once this bitterness wears off, there's going to be some very attractive offers dangled to these schools to compete. It's going to happen because people want it to happen, and there's a lot of money to be made by putting those two teams in the same I, I, we, we seem to read a lot about this story, Steve Ockler, but is too much being made about it? Is it time to say, just, let's just move on? I'm kind of the, of the opinion that, yes, it, maybe it's time to move on. And maybe someday, you know, the teams will put together kind of a spectacle and play each other in basketball or football. But my concern is, is I don't know if it'll really be the same because Missouri and KU were in the same conference for a number of years. And, you know, in addition to the proximity that they had with each other and the history there, one thing that was so important about that rivalry was a lot of the games had an impact in conference standings and you know an impact in postseason play and you know and you and I know that there are rivalries between conferences elsewhere but taking it out and having this break I think if it comes back it'll feel maybe a little contrived. Would it be different? It would never be the same I, again. Neil? I couldn't disagree more. I believe that it would make it more bitter. It would make it bigger. They were brothers in arms for 104 years. They were in the same league. They are no longer in the same league. They would be not only playing for supremacy of Kansas City and then this border, the state line, they would be proving, hey, our conference is better than your conference. Oklahoma, Texas certainly thrived as a non-conference rivalry, and I believe the bitterness, the border war, I, I think it would be very alive. Look, they're going to play, and the sad thing is it's not going to be in our area because the NCAA is going to mandate it in the NCAA tournament, and they're going to end up playing in, in St. Louis or Timbuktu, and, in, and some bowl game is going to put them together. You watch. They're going to end up playing in the Cotton Bowl or something in Dallas if Kansas ever gets their act together, and we're going to all be very excited about it. It's just going to be too bad it won't be in our city. Next on Week in Review, drivers in Kansas City beware. Police are doubling their traffic enforcement tickets. The Kansas City Star reports officers wrote more than 6,000 speeding tickets in April. That's more than twice the number they issued in April of last year. Tickets for all traffic violations increased nearly 50% in April when compared to the same month the year before. But some are questioning the timing of the ticketing surge. Is the step up in tickets directly correlated to the recent court ruling forcing the city to end its red light camera program that has generated more than $2 million in revenue since the camera cameras were installed in 2009. Steve Ockrod? Well, the, 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 the timing is interesting. And another footnote that it was in the Kansas City Star article that I noticed was that it appears that some of the officers who would otherwise be tending to violent crime hotspots are going to be able to devote themselves to ticketing. And in a city where violent crime is a serious issue, I kind of have to question the policy of that. Now, the city communi communications person, Chris Hernandez, a former reporter, said that Former the, guest on this show. Absolutely, former occasions. guest on this show, yes. uh, said that tickets right, you know, were at a 1947 level and that really they'd never kept up. So uh, they're just trying to make up for lost time. Well, Dave, there's a little bit of truth in all of it, Nick, as, it, as is usually the case, that, that there is probably some connection to the loss of revenue from the red light cameras, but there may also be a legitimate policy decision to pursue reckless driving more aggressively. We do, we do, you know, have fatal accidents in Kansas City, and there may be some effort to just make more money. I mean, you know, traffic tickets are a significant part of any city's revenue. They make a lot of money from people who drive too fast. So maybe all of that sort of scrunches in together and has, has caused this latest ripple down. Kevin, I, I tend to go with Steve's analysis in that whether they like it or not, it sends a, a, a signal that we think going after 
traffic issues is more significant than tackling the horrific violent crime problems we have in this town. And I do think it's clearly connected to the fact that a huge revenue stream got cut off with this red light thing. I, I don't think Kansas City, from my experience and from what I read in our own newspaper, has an exorbitant problem with, with troubled drivers and speeding and car collisions. It happens for sure. But I do see there's a tremendous amount of police resources dedicated towards traffics, towards these DWI stops. I think they have a practical platoon of cops stationed at these checkpoints, which personally I think are a real violation of a lot of people's civil rights. But that's a whole other issue. But I think if the police department of Kansas City wanted to show it meant business, it would be a heck of a lot more aggressive about going after the violent crime problems in our town. It's already going to be bigger than the Sprint campus, in fact, the biggest office development in Kansas City history. But this week, Cerner's plans to bring 15,000 jobs to the site of the former Bannister Mall gets even bigger as company executives announced they want to expand the scope of the more than $4 billion project by nearly 20 percent, adding 50 acres, giving the finished complex more green space, but also a new training center and health clinic for employees. It also balloons the cost by $213 million. Can anybody be upset by this? Is this turning out to be a better deal for Kansas City than having the soccer stadium here? Now, Sporting Kansas City um, cost $200 million to build. That's Sporting Park. Cerner is investing 20 times that on this site. Never mind the jobs, 15,000 here, about 200 at Sporting Park, Kevin. I, you know, Nick, three years ago, Kansas City felt like it got its lunch handed to it by Wyandotte County when they grabbed the uh, Sporting Kansas City Stadium and several thousand certain jobs. I think at the end of the day, we're doing much better. I think having that Bannister Mall property renovated and converted into a thriving home for a corporation that plans to create a lot of jobs without some of the hassles associated with having a sports facility like that. And a big part of this also was I think Cerner wanted to clean up Everything around there, I mean, a huge issue for years with that Bannister Mall property has been its residual negative image in the community. A part of what's going on here is they're getting rid of a couple of problem motels that apparently have been a huge source of police calls in that area. And again, is that the kind of property you want next to your high-tech, spanking, brand-new campus? So I think you uh, poll people in South Kansas City, this is great, great news. Now, you have been tracking lots of other types of tax situations in Kansas City, lots of tax break issues, including Burns and McDonald. Sure. Can anybody be upset about this? Steve? You know, I've been skeptical for a long time of the use of incentives in a lot of cases. This one, though, I mean, in the, in the incentive ask is huge on this one. But given, given that Bannister Mall was a truly blighted area of town, it was going to be very hard to do anything with. If Cerner does come up with the 15,000 jobs, by 2024 or any point in the future, then yes, I think that's an appropriate use of tax incentives. Clearly, Neil Patterson, the founder of Cerner, has the money. They've also been mentioned, by the way, as potential owners of the Royals. Neil Jones, even as late as last month, that story still circulating on national sports blogs. Has David Glass got an interest in selling the team? And would Neil Patterson be interested in buying it? That's the million dollar question. I mean, Kevin Keatsman on 810 has been very vocal about he would like to see, I believe he said he would like to see, and he certainly floated the idea of, of, of the Cerner owners buying the Royals. <laughs> you know, the Royals have not won on the field, but have you noticed that they've been very stable? We don't hear a lot of talk about them being sold. We don't hear a lot of talk about being underfunded. I mean, you can argue about they didn't spend enough money the first five or six years that Glass owned the team, and that would probably be correct, but they've been very stable. But there is no question that uh, the people who have run Cerner know how to run an operation, and they have done it in soccer. They, they, they built this largely on their own money. They got some tax help. There's no question about it to build over in Wyandotte County. That's an unbelievable model. And if they could bring that to the Royals, I think it would be very successful. I think the, the, the larger question is, does Mr. Glass want to give this, this over to his son Dan? Dan runs the team as the president day to day. But does he want to be the owner? Does he want to be the front man? And that's the, the larger question. Missouri's casino industry is officially 20 years old this week, but is it an industry in decline? Missouri Governor Jay Nixon just announced he was slashing $35 million in public school funding. Why? Because of declining lottery and casino revenues. The spending cuts come on top of $22 million in school budget cuts Nixon announced in April, also as a result of declining state revenues from lottery sales and casino taxes. Is this a sign that after two decades of throwing dice and feeding quarters into slot machines, 
there's less money to be made in Missouri casinos, Dave Halley. I think there, a lot of things are happening. You've had a recession that's cut a little bit into gambling uh, activity in the state. It's a mature business. It isn't as exciting as it was 20 years ago when casinos first came to Kansas City. Other states have places to gamble. You can gamble out by the uh, uh, sporting park, for example, at the Hollywood Casino uh, near the racetrack. There's a downtown Kansas City, Kansas place to gamble. You can gamble in Indian casinos uh, around the state of Kansas. So uh, all of those things together, uh, in essence, suggest that there will be a steady level of income for s cities and states from gaming. But the idea of a big bump or some big growth in that probably has passed. It Kevin. also shows pun intended, the gamble of relying on gambling as a significant pillar of your state budget is a pretty shaky proposition, and I'm going to stop with the puns right now. But I mean, <laughs> you know, again, it's, it's one of the most hilarious things in my lifetime, has seen the morphing of gambling from being a horrific vice in my grandmother's generation to being a matter-of-fact major source of public funding these days. Well, you rely on something like that and certain factors that Dave mentioned, et cetera, start coming into play. You know, again, it's a part of let's try to get something uh, for nothing in a way, uh, you know, as far as just funding our vital public services, and we're paying a bit of a price here now. Okay, and finally, just before adjourning their recent legislative session, the Missouri Senate and House approved a measure directing the Missouri Department of Economic Development to figure out what it would take to get the Super Bowl to Kansas City, the NFL awarding the Super Bowl to New Jersey, where the game was played in an outside stadium on a chilly night last February. Lawmakers now want to attract the big game to Harrow Arrowhead. Is that really a possibility? Quickly, Neil Jones? The video we're seeing is not of the stadium, which is over in New Jersey. The video is of Times Square in New York City. We don't have Times Square. We have a beautiful stadium. We have nothing like New York City. No, I don't think it's coming. Steve Bockrod. You know, I think the fact that they put it in New Jersey for that one for that one time they've awarded it to Minnesota gives some impetus to thinking that it could, but it's probably unlikely. So lawmakers were wasting their time, Dave Helling? <laughs> no, they never waste their time down at Jefferson City. All right. <laughs> and that is our Week in Review. Thank you. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.